Although I may have frequently heard the history of my ancestry, my recollection is too imperfect to enable me to trace it further back than my father and mother, whom I have often heard mention the families from whence they originated, as having possessed wealth and honourable stations under the government of the country in which they resided. On the account of the great length of time that has elapsed since I was separated from my parents and friends, and having heard the story of their nativity only in the days of my childhood, I am not able to state positively which of the two countries, Ireland or Scotland, was the land of my parents' birth and education. It, however, is my impression that they were born and brought up in Ireland. My father's name was Thomas Jemison, and my mother's, before her marriage with him, was Jane Irwin. Their affection for each other was mutual, and of that happy kind which tends directly to sweeten the cup of life, to render connubial sorrows lighter, to assuage every discontentment and to promote not only their own comfort, but that of all who come within the circle of their acquaintance. Of their happiness I recollect to have heard them speak, and the remembrance I yet retain of their mildness and perfect agreement in the government of their children, together with their mutual attention to our common education, manners, religious instruction and wants, renders it a fact in my mind that they were ornaments to the married state and examples of connubial love worthy of imitation. After my remembrance, they were strict observers of religious duties, for it was the daily practice of my father, morning and evening, to attend, in his family, to the worship of God. Resolved to leave the land of their nativity, they removed from their residence to a port in Ireland, where they lived but a short time before they set sail for this country, in the year 1742 or three on board the ship Mary William, bound to Philadelphia, in the state of Pennsylvania. The intestine divisions, civil wars, and ecclesiastical rigidity and domination that prevailed those days were the causes of their leaving their mother country and a home in the American wilderness, under the mild and temperate government of the descendants of William Penn, where without fear they might worship God and perform their usual avocations. In Europe my parents had two sons and one daughter, whose names were John, Thomas and Betsy, with whom, after having put their effects on board, they embarked, leaving a large connection of relatives and friends under all those painful sensations which are only felt when kindred souls give the parting hand and last farewell to those to whom they are endeared by every friendly tie. In the course of their voyage I was born to be the sport of fortune and almost an outcast to civil society. To stem the current of adversity through a long chain of vicissitudes unsupported by the advice of tender parents or the hand of an affectionate friend, and even without the enjoyment from others of any of those tender sympathies that are adapted to the sweetening of society, except such as naturally flow from uncultivated minds that have been calloused by ferocity. Excepting my birth, nothing remarkable occurred to my parents on their passage, and they were safely landed at Philadelphia. My father, being fond of rural life, and having been bred to agricultural pursuits, soon left the city, and removed his family to the then frontier settlements of Pennsylvania, to a tract of excellent land lying on Marsh Creek. At that place he cleared a large farm, and for seven or eight years enjoyed the fruits of his industry. Peace attended their labours, and they had nothing to alarm them, save the midnight howl of the prowling wolf, or the terrifying shriek of the ferocious panther, as they occasionally visited their improvements, to take a lamb or a calf to satisfy their hunger. During this period my mother had two sons, between whose ages there was a difference of about three years. The oldest was named Matthew and the other Robert. Health presided on every countenance, and vigour and strength characterised every exertion. Our mansion was a little paradise. The morning of my childish happy days will ever stand fresh in my remembrance, notwithstanding the many severe trials through which I have passed in arriving at my present situation at so advanced an age. Even at this remote period, the recollection of my pleasant home at my father's, of my parents, of my brothers and sister, and of the manner in which I was deprived of them all at once affects me so powerfully that I am almost overwhelmed with grief that is seemingly insupportable. Frequently I dream of those happy days, but alas, they are gone. They have left me to be carried through a long life dependent for the little pleasures of nearly seventy years upon the tender mercies of the Indians. 
In the spring of 1752, and through the succeeding seasons, the stories of Indian barbarities inflicted upon the whites in those days frequently excited in my parents the most serious alarm for our safety. The next year the storm gathered faster. Many murders were committed, and many captives were exposed to meet death in its most frightful form by having their bodies stuck full of pine splinters, which were immediately set on fire, while their tormentors, exulting in their distress, would rejoice at their agony. In 1754, an army for the protection of the settlers and to drive back the French and Indians was raised from the militia of the colonial governments and placed, secondarily, under the command of Colonel's George Washington. In that army I had an uncle, whose name was John Jemison, who was killed at the battle at the Great Meadow or Fort Necessity. His wife had died some time before this and left a young child, which my mother nursed in the most tender manner, till its mother's sister took it away a few months after my uncle's death. The French and Indians, after the surrender of Fort Necessity by Colonel Washington, which happened the same season and soon after his victory over them at that place, grew more and more terrible. The death of the whites, and plundering and burning their property, was apparently their only object, but as yet, we had not heard the death yell, nor seen the smoke of a dwelling that had been lit by an Indian's hand. The return of a New Year's Day found us unmolested, and though we knew that the enemy was at no great distance from us, my father concluded that he would continue to occupy his land another season, expecting, probably from the great exertions which the government was then making, that as soon as the troops could commence their operations in the spring, the enemy would be conquered and compelled to agree to a treaty of peace. In the preceding autumn, my father either moved to another part of his farm or to another neighbourhood, a short distance from our former abode. I well recollect moving, and that the barn that was on the place we moved to was built of logs, though the house was a good one. The winter of 1754 was as mild as a common fall season, and the spring presented a pleasant seed time and indicated a plenteous harvest. My father, with the assistance of his oldest sons, repaired his farm as usual, and was daily preparing the soil for the reception of the seed. His cattle and sheep were numerous, and according to the best idea of wealth that I can now form, he was wealthy. But alas, how transitory are all human affairs, how fleeting are riches, how brittle the invisible thread on which all earthly comforts are suspended. Peace in a moment can take an immeasurable flight, health can lose its rosy cheeks, and life will vanish like a vapour at the appearance of the sun. In one fatal day our prospects were all blasted, and death by cruel hands inflicted upon almost the whole of the family. On a pleasant day in the spring of 1755, when my father was sowing flaxseed and my brothers driving the teams, I was sent to a neighbour's house, a distance of perhaps a mile, to procure a horse and return with it the next morning. I went as I was directed. I was out of the house in the beginning of the evening, and saw a sheet widespread approaching towards me, in which I was caught, as I have ever since believed, and deprived of my senses. The family soon found me on the ground, almost lifeless, as they said, took me in, and made use of every remedy in their power for my recovery, but without effect till daybreak, when my senses returned, and I soon found myself in good health, so that I went home with the horse very early in the morning. The appearance of that sheet, I have ever considered as a forerunner of the melancholy catastrophe that so soon afterwards happened to our family, and my being caught in it, I believe, was ominous of my preservation from death at the time we were captured. 